the triumph of health ideals what is the body after all but the spirit breaking through the flesh or health but beauty in the organism every good emotion makes a health and life promoting change in the body every thought is registered in the brain by a physical change more or less permanent in the tissue cells the coming man will find it as easy to counteract an unfriendly vicious thought by turning on the counter thought to neutralize it as to rob the hot water of its burning power by turning on the cold water faucet there is a divine something in man which never was sick and never can be that divine self the image of the creator perfect unchangeable indestructible immortal and which some time and somewhere must drive out all trace of sin disease and death in mankind Hufland. even those who do not believe in christian science as a whole must be impressed with the scientist's wonderful religious optimism their inspiring mental attitude the hopeful way in which they face life always looking toward the light toward health toward prosperity toward success and turning their backs upon the darkness upon everything which can mar their health their efficiency their happiness is creating a new world for thousands of discouraged souls christian scientists insist that since god has created everything that is and since he is perfect is all in all he could not possibly create anything unlike himself such as disease or anything else that is not good for his children god is harmony they reason and he could not create discord he is truth and he could not create error god is love and he could not create the opposite of love hatred jealousy envy selfishness any evil emotion or passion hence all disease all discord all the enemies of the race all satanic influences in the world must be accounted for in some other way than as decrees of his will for perfection could not have produced these imperfections love could not create anything antagonistic to itself scientists take a positive and vigorous stand against the admission to their mind of any of the enemies of their health their prosperity their happiness or their destiny not only is all thought of failure and poverty banished but they close the portals of their mind against fear worry and anxiety against the ravages of jealousy the poison of hatred envy and selfishness they try to keep their mental realm clear of all black forbidding pictures of all sorts of distressing emotions and unfriendly thoughts while they open it to the things which help inspire and bring hope the friend thoughts and emotions joy gladness love truth and divine inspiration they believe that all human beings were not only made to be healthy but also to be happy successful prosperous they regard poverty no less than illness as a mental disease to be treated in the same manner as bodily disease and this cheerful religious optimism which they try steadily to maintain is not alone a healing force but is also a great disease resisting power health wholeness is one of the most important and necessary factors in attainment of those things which every normal human being desires peace power plenty success and happiness the scientist's religious optimism is a potent force for placing the mind in the most favorable condition for the attainment of all these things it removes all hindrances to full complete self-expression it is just as necessary to hold the victorious attitude toward health as it is to hold the victorious attitude toward our career and everything which affects it it is just as necessary to get rid of our doubts and fears regarding our physical well-being as it is to get rid of our doubts and fears regarding our ability to succeed if we would be strong and vigorous it is quite important as to visualize health to hold the health ideal to keep the perfect health picture constantly in the mind as it is to keep the prosperity the success ideal in the mind when we are striving for an independence the habit of always holding a high ideal in our health of thinking of ourselves as well vigorous physically and mentally perfect will go very far toward building up a strong disease resisting barrier between ourselves and all our health enemies on the other hand people who never think of themselves as whole healthy active and robust but who constantly hold in mind a picture of themselves as weak ailing without vim or stamina with little or no disease resisting power are liable at any time to become victims of disease 
the building up of a strong health thought barrier a vigorous health conviction between ourselves and disease is the best sort of health insurance fearing disease thinking ill health visualizing physical suffering is the surest way of attracting those things physicians know that the awful incubus of doubt and worry in the minds of patients the fear that their disease may be fatal is the greatest obstacle to their recovery we head toward our doubts our fears our convictions regarding our health just as we do toward our doubts fears and conviction regarding other things if we are convinced that we are not going to be strong rugged virile if we fear that we are likely to develop inherited weakness and disease tendencies we are headed toward these conditions and will probably realize them on the contrary if we hold the victorious attitude toward health if we visualize the health ideal the health conviction we head mentally toward health and what we head toward mentally is the pattern of that which is continually being built into our life structure a healthy body is healthy thought externalized man's normal condition is that of robust health vigorous vitality tremendous power of endurance the creator evidently intended the human machine to run harmoniously without friction without weakness or disability of any kind the created is part of the creator an indestructible part of him when we rise to a full consciousness of this we shall be victors over disease instead of victims of it we shall be conquerors instead of slaves of conditions nearly a century ago a celebrated german physician said that there is something in man which was never born is never sick and never dies and that it is this something this omnipotent force within which in reality heals our diseases no matter what we may call it this something that repairs and renews is one with the force that creates us we may name it variously the god principle the christ within us the divine principle the omnipotent force or anything else we please the name doesn't matter all mean the same thing that is the creative the all-sustaining force that holds the universe in harmony there is something in you that is lord over your physical organs there is a power in you back of the flesh but not of it which dominates the flesh and that is the real you your partner in that power is the intelligence that created you you are indissolubly interlinked with that intelligence you can no more be wiped out of existence than the creator who made you because you are an immortal expression of himself you are his masterpiece and his work must partake of his qualities of his perfection of his omnipotence of his omniscience the trouble with us is we do not rise to the power and dignity of our divinity we do not half believe we are divine we have a sort of vague theory that we are mere puppets thrown off as separate units into space without any vital connection with the power that gave us life this false theory is causing our sufferings the reason why we are such shriveled scrub oaks of human beings is found in the dried up mean stingy ideal of ourselves which we have been taught to hold we have been reared to think of ourselves as poor miserable worms of the dust unworthy to come into the presence of our father mother god even though we are fashioned in his image instead of carrying through life an ideal of our mental and physical perfection we carry an ideal of a defective diseased physically and mentally imperfect being the mind being the molder of the body the life-giving process within us build the sort of body that answers to the model in the mind the ideal which we hold of ourselves what we really believe ourselves to be we tend to become we keep our minds filled with all sorts of discord sick pictures and of course all of these mental images reappear in the body react upon the life on the other hand every time we affirm that we are one with the creative force of the universe that nothing can separate us from our oneness with the one we tend to build our bodies into the ideal state of perfect health mental physical and moral wholeness if we could hold continually to the ideal of our wholeness and visualize ourselves as perfect beings even as he is perfect and constantly try to live up to our ideal any tendency to imperfection to discord to disease would be eliminated we are only just beginning to realize the tremendous import of the idea that we really fashion our bodies to correspond with our thoughts 
that we are co-creators of ourselves with the divine power which is back of the flesh but not of it a prominent surgeon in speaking of infantile paralysis says that the physician's mental attitude toward it has a great deal to do with its cure and that he should hold firmly in the mind the idea that the disease is curable every physician should also be a metaphysician he should be a profound believer in the principle that the power which created the patient can recreate him can repair damages restore diseased and lost tissues the most advanced physicians do believe that at best they can but help nature in her healing process they realize that the same power which created the patient is present in the healing of every wound every broken bone and every hurt we suffer the surgeon sets the bone dresses the wound but the same power that first created the flesh and bone must do the healing the mental healer vigorously denies the reality of disease in the sense that truth is a reality to him all is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation as mrs eddy says and therefore all must be good only the good can be real as god made all that is the persistent denial that anything could exist which the creator did not create and that he could make anything unlike himself is one of the fundamental principles of the christian science faith to the healer health is a vital immortal principle the everlasting fact and disease although it seems painfully real to the sufferer is but a false belief the healer holds in mind only what he desires to establish in his patient's mind he shuts out everything else health is what he wishes to establish and to do this he holds incessantly and tenuously to the health ideal he refuses to see the sick diseased man or woman and persists in visualizing the ideal one that god intended to him the defective deficient suffering being which disease and physical discord have made is not the real man or woman that being is only a travesty of the ideal perfect creature the creator planned he does not allow himself to think of or to picture disease symptoms to visualize the physical appearance of disease would be to acknowledge its reality and this would be to defeat his healing he could not for example cure cancer or tuberculosis while mentally picturing the horrible symptoms of these diseases he wishes to keep all such things out of his mind because of their baleful suggestiveness visualizing them would merely etch their reality deeper and deeper into his consciousness and the suggestion would be conveyed into the patient's consciousness the mental healer's aim is to produce in the mind of the person he is treating a consciousness of the scientific reality of health and of the unreality of disease it does not matter how the disease symptoms may contradict his principle or how loudly pain may scream for recognition he persists in considering disease unreal and in holding the scientific sense of health as the reality he relies wholly upon divine mind as the great healing potency and steadily affirms his patient's oneness with his divine source and that disease cannot exist in the divine presence at the very outset he encourages his patient by affirming that however his physical discord or disease may seem to him it cannot affect the god image in him because that is perfect as god himself is perfect and that in reality there can be no disease truth and harmony he asserts are the great facts of life error is not a reality but merely the absence of truth discord is not a reality but merely the absence of harmony he assures him that he is god's child and that god's image cannot be sick distressed or diseased of course he says this seems very real to you painfully real but it is not reality in the sense that truth is a reality this is discord the absence of harmony and divine harmony will antidote all discord just as truth will neutralize error and as love will neutralize all hatred jealousy or revenge or as confidence self-assurance will neutralize fear doubt or self-depreciation the healer holds continually the healing suggestions and concentrates on arousing in his patient expectancy of relief by bracing his hope confidence assurance and faith in divine mind that restores renews and heals he tries to stimulate and put into active operation the healing potencies latent in him to awaken in his mind the lost divine image and to impress upon them the idea that this divine image cannot possibly be dominated or in any other way affected by disease 
i have seen a chemist pour a few drops of liquid from different crucibles into a jar of muddy water and in a few minutes the mud would disappear and the water be as pure as crystal this is in effect what the mental healer does in treating a patient no matter what the disease is his great remedy lies in mental chemistry in neutralizing destroying the error with its natural antidote the healer's constant affirmation that there can be no sickness no disease in god's image in man is a powerful suggestion which tends to weaken the grip of error in his patient's body the very shutting out of all fear of the terror of disease and death is a great step towards a cure because these things are depressing to all bodily functions everything that discourages that makes the patient despondent is a great devitalizer and constantly lowers his disease resisting power the arousing belief that the healer is a sort of motorman who puts up the patient's dropped trolley pole thus making connection with the wire carrying infinite power or that he is a wireless operator who is connecting him with his divine source the source of health and happiness and that he is actually receiving the flow of divine force of peace of immortal life is of itself a tremendous healing agency when he has succeeded in establishing in the mind of his patient the vigorous conviction that health is the everlasting principle the great fundamental unavoidable fact the healer has gone far toward establishing a scientific consciousness of health and has laid a most important health foundation after a little practice a sick person can do wonderful things for himself through the vitalizing force of autosuggestion he can be his own physician he can recover health and keep it by applying to himself the same principles that the healer applies to his patient in this way he can keep himself in conscious union with the divine source of all supply of all good all health there are sufficient latent potencies in every human being if he would only arouse and make them operative to keep him in health and harmony we can all be our own healers if we will the stream must be as pure as its fountainhead unless contaminated later and there is where we humans come in we contaminate the health stream with our thought poisons our doubts our fears our unbeliefs our brutal passions our selfishness our greed our hatreds our jealousies our revenge our ingratitude for life for the blessings we enjoy all of these things tend to pollute the stream which we receive pure as it flows from the crystal fountain the divine source of all good but the practice of divine chemistry will enable us to clear up our muddy life streams we have in ourselves the remedies which will neutralize the vicious poisons we have allowed to flow into and befoul our life stream we can by the right use of our powers purify it as the chemist purified the jar of muddy water by right thinking we can neutralize the poison sewage of our bodies just as the chemist can take the foul sewage water which flows out from a city and by the help of chemicals neutralize all the filth making it absolutely pure again by applying their antidotes we can neutralize the poisons of disease the results of wrong thinking and living which sap and embitter our lives which make us suffer from all sorts of ills and leave us unable to accomplish one-tenth of what we might if we had that splendid physical and mental vigor which is normal to humanity we must offer the same uncompromising opposition to the reality of all kinds of disease mental and physical that the mental healer does we must see ourselves as he sees his patient in the wholeness the completeness the creator intended it is the ideal man or woman we must visualize never the one weakened deformed by horrible diseases or their symptoms by recognizing only the real man or woman unaffected by wrong thinking we cut off the vicious effects of the mental enemies which are fighting to perpetuate disease or other unfortunate conditions the constant holding of the health ideal of the truth thought the health and prosperity thought the optimistic thought the kindly cheerful helpful thought and the shutting out of all their opposites not only help to restore health but also tremendously the disease resisting power right thought is health efficiency and happiness tonic the vital thing in establishing health is to adopt the victorious attitude toward it as toward every other good thing we desire if we wish to have abounding health then who doesn't we must cultivate implicit faith in health as our birthright 
in the truth that being the children of perfection we must partake of the qualities of perfection and hence be free from the imperfection of disease or sickness without faith in our wholeness we are not and cannot be whole without faith in the healing power of divine chemistry no healing is possible either by patient or healer the patient may not always have a conscious faith but the healer has and a similar faith is aroused in the patient later as he begins to feel the divine power operating and working like a leaven in his nature there is no one thing that is emphasized so much in the bible and especially in christ's teachings as faith every benefit every healing depends for its efficacy on the sufferer's faith in all of his healing this one condition of faith was imperative according to thy faith be it unto thee when the disciples told their master that they could not heal certain cases he rebuked them and told them that they had failed because of their lack of faith according to thy faith be it unto thee he reiterated constantly he recognized the great healing power of faith and impressed upon his followers the truth that without it no healing was possible every physician knows that his patient's faith is in his power to cure him in the efficacy of the remedies he applies are curative agencies faith in medicinal remedies is what makes them effective it is faith that furnishes the potency of thousands of so-called remedies which have no intrinsic value whatever we all know how the visualizing of disease and the fear of it affect the mind in undermining the health ideal confidence in our health is really its sustaining and buttressing power for the moment we destroy this we lessen our resisting power and invite disease the image perpetually held in the conscious mind becomes indelibly etched in the subconscious mind and the body conforms to the thought to attain perfect health we must hold the image of physical perfection we must constantly keep in mind this ideal state we must build ourselves thought pictures of a superb body in all its strength and wholeness we must relentlessly strangle every image of weakness or disease every sick suggestion that would blur the picture of perfect wholeness and harmony into which we wish to grow what a revolution we would make in our lives if we could only learn to live this health ideal instead of its opposite the disease ideal every child should be reared to think health instead of disease should be made to realize that health is the everlasting fact that disease is not a necessary evil and was not intended for us that it was not intended we should suffer if the young mind were saturated from infancy with health ideas and ideals it would build up a strong disease resisting power that would make it immune to all health enemies if every child were trained to believe that he was a god in the making that he had within him the embryo of divinity which ought to develop into a godlike being we should not have so many mental and physical lilliputians one of our great health troubles lies in the fact that we have been accustomed from childhood to lay too much emphasis on matter on the support of the body as a matter of fact the mind is everything but mind is not confined to the head alone we are all mind we think all over we live all over our sensations are the intelligent expression of all the cells of the body the body is a great cooperative institution composed of billions of cells some of these cells have a higher functioning quality than others but they all have their appointed places every cell is an important member of the body corporation and has a voice in the government of the whole when we are wounded or diseased for instance billions of these tiny cell repairers healers renewers health builders rush instantly to the wounded part to repair and restore the injured tissues we are all conscious that there is continually going on within us these repairing renewing reinvigorating as well as healing processes we feel that there is a marvelous and beneficent intelligence ever working miracles within us a power which heals our wounds and cures our hurts whence comes the intelligence which governs and directs the work of these little builders and repairers it comes from the within of us for our objective mind is comparatively passive in the process but the great intelligence back of the flesh which keeps the heart beating the lungs breathing and all the various bodily functions in activity never ceases working and never leaves us for an instant it permeates every atom of the body 
illuminating each separate cell with a reflection of its own light scientists are making marvelous discoveries regarding the location of the seat of intelligence mind until recently it was supposed to be confined solely to the brain but now we know the mind the brain or the thinking part of us extends the entire length of the spinal cord that there is gray brain matter everywhere in the sympathetic nervous system in fact recent experiments indicate selective power in the cells all through the body regular gray matter has been found in the fingertips of deaf dumb and blind people thus showing that wherever there is a need there is intelligence we know what marvels blind and deaf mutes perform by their sense of touch in distinguishing colors even fine variations of shades in delicate fabrics incorrectly sensing denominations of paper money and coins and accurately describing statues and other forms from merely running their fingers over them this shows that intelligence is everywhere in the body some of our foremost scientists now believe that the cells composing each organ form a sort of cooperative community intelligence which presides over that particular organ they hold that the bodily organs have what may be termed minds of their own they are virtually connected with the so-called spinal column brain and the solar plexus brain as well as with the brain proper this theory is borne out in fact we know how quickly the stomach sympathizes with the mental attitude how it responds to our thoughts our emotions also how quickly the heart the kidneys respond to our mental states fear worry joy anxiety love hate jealousy whatever emotion dominates us if there were not a very intimate connection between the brain and the stomach and the same principle applies to the heart the kidneys and other organs the digestion would not be affected so seriously by our changing moods and emotions inasmuch as it is so affected is it not reasonable to assume that the stomach cells are influenced by the thought which you project into them is it not reasonable to assume that by sending into these cells black gloomy discouraging pictures of indigestion and dyspepsia you injuriously affect them if these cells have intelligence and if they respond instantly to our different mental states as we know they do isn't it natural that they should be correspondingly affected by our opinion of them by our lack of confidence in them our suspicion of their ability to digest our food properly by the constant complaining of our stomach and our miserable digestive apparatus give a dog a bad name and you might as well kill him is an old saying in the same way impress force home on your stomach your heart your liver or any other bodily organ the conviction that it is inefficient weak good for nothing and in addition swallow a mouthful of mental dyspepsia with every mouthful of food and sooner or later it will accept your verdict and be just what you claim it is in other words instead of handicapping them by wrong thought we must give our bodily organs a fair chance to do their legitimate work if we expect them to act perfectly as the creator intended they should we must treat them as we would treat our children we must by right thinking help them to be normal instead of making them abnormal by doubting being suspicious of them we must visualize them as our co-workers our partners our friends not as our enemies our tormentors just think of the horrible pictures of the various organs people get from medical books which describe minutely symptoms of diseases which they imagine they have many people never visualize a normal picture of themselves they never think of themselves as the perfect beings god intended them to be what they hold constantly in mind is a picture of an abnormal diseased weak defective creature they picture their stomach their liver their kidneys their heart in a diseased imperfect condition instead of regarding them as friends as members of the same family they look on them as malicious enemies who cause them constant suffering oh they cry out i've got such a miserable stomach i can't eat anything everything i eat hurts me my treacherous old heart how it pumps i can't walk or do any of the things i like because of it my liver is all upset i seem to be out of kilter everywhere my kidneys are affected my back troubles me and i really might as well be dead such a horrible visualizing and belittling of the hard-working bodily organs would ruin the health of the best trained athlete if you would be a friend to yourself you must be a friend of your organs 
which are so intimately and sympathetically connected with your brain mind the central station of your body you must believe in their perfection in their normal functioning you must picture them trying to help you to carry out your great life purpose instead of working at cross purposes with you you must have confidence in them think of them as your friends instead of enemies handicapping your success and ruining your chances in life replace the pictures of diseased organs with their opposites pictures of their wholeness their completeness their soundness and you will find yourself coming into health and power assume the victorious attitude and think of yourself as an absolutely perfect being divine immortal possessing superb health a magnificent physique a vigorous constitution a sublime mind every morning when you rise before you go to bed at night and whenever you think of it during the day stoutly affirm the fact of your perfection physically mentally and morally constantly assert mentally and when alone orally i am health because i am of god god is my life he is the creative power that sustains and upholds me every instant this power is perpetually recreating me and trying to keep me up to the ideal the original plan of my being when i was created i shall cooperate with it today and every day i shall aim to be perfection even as my father there is a great resolve power in the mere resolve to be well strong and vigorous in affirming and tenaciously holding the perfect ideal of ourselves which the creator had in his plan of us there is a recreative force in the realization that any departure from this ideal means departure from god from perfect health from the reality of the perfect physical mental and moral being planned by him you will be surprised to see how this mental attitude this visualized physical ideal will be reproduced in the body the mind is the body builder the great health sculptor and we cannot surpass our mental model if there is a weakness or flaw in the thought model there will be corresponding deficiencies in the health statue as long as we think ill health doubt our ability to be strong and vigorous as long as we hold the conviction of the presence of inherited weakness and disease tendencies look upon ourselves as victims instead of conquerors of ill health in short as long as the mental model is defective perfect health is impossible joyous abounding health can be established just as anything else can be established by right thinking and right living by thinking health instead of disease thinking strength instead of weakness harmony instead of discord thinking true thoughts instead of error thoughts love thoughts instead of hatred thoughts health thoughts upbuilding thoughts instead of destructive tearing down thoughts a great many regular physicians now and soon all will show patients how they can make use of the great healing medicinal power of thought the miracle of right thinking which unites them with the force back of the flesh they will show each patient what attitudes of mind what affirmations and what auto suggestions will tend to keep him in harmony they will teach him the healing use of suggestion the physician of the future will use largely for his remedies ideas mental attitudes and suggestions the time will come when parents and teachers will realize the tremendous force the character building power in the affirmations of health wholeness completeness harmony they will teach children to exert this power that will drive out discord and dispel disease they will impress upon the young that affirmation of perfect ideals holding in the mind the model of a perfect man a perfect woman not the one marred crippled shorn of strength and beauty by violation of mental law or by vicious living will protect them from all assaults from without and from within if that mind was always in us which was in christ the mind that gives health peace and happiness that perpetuates harmony truth and beauty we should never know discord of any kind perfect health would be the rule and not the exception because we should never transgress the laws of our being you are headed toward your ideal faith and the ideal still remain the most powerful levers of progress and of happiness jean finot if we are content to unfold the life within according to the pattern given us we shall reach the highest end of which we are capable we tend to grow into the likeness of the things we long for most think about most the gods we worship write their names on our faces emerson 
in hawthorne's story the great stone face we have an impressive illustration of the power of an ideal one's memory holds a vivid picture of its hero whose mind had dwelt from childhood on the local tradition that a man-child should be born whose face would resemble that of the mountain profile above the little hamlet of his nativity and that this child would eventually become the leader and savior of the people so wholeheartedly did he believe the legend so earnestly did he long for its fulfillment and so constantly did his eyes dwell on the prophetic profile that unconsciously his own features changed until outwardly as well as inwardly he completely embodied the ideal which his mind had absorbed on every hand we see illustrations of the transforming power of the ideal it is outpictured in the faces we see in the street in trains and shops in theatres and churches wherever people congregate how quickly we can select from a crowd of strangers the successful business man his initiative leadership executive ability speak out of his face and manner the same is true of men in other vocations of the scholar the clergyman the lawyer the teacher the doctor the farmer the day laborer go into any institution factory store or other place of business and you can quickly detect the nature of the ideals out pictured in the faces in the expression in the manner of the people you see there visit sing sing and you will see the power of the ideal which has worked like a leaven in its inmates the criminal suggestion the criminal thought the criminal ideal is reflected in the faces of those who visualize crime planned and thought out in its details long before they committed the criminal act whatever we hold in our minds dwell upon contemplate whatever is dominant in our motives will stand out in our flesh so the world can read it many absolutely authentic cases of stigmata are recorded in the lives of medieval saints on whose bodies appeared an exact reproduction of all the wounds of the crucified christ some of these cases were in convents and monasteries and were the result of long and intense concentration of the mind of the subject upon the physical sufferings of christ frequently the phenomena occurred after the austerities of lent during which the monks and nuns had focused more intensely and steadily upon the tortures of the saviour's passion and death if the contemplation of those tortures the constant mental picturing of the sufferings of the god-man the soul's great sympathy with its ideal could change the very tissues of the body could reproduce on it the actual physical marks of the cruel spear in the side of the nails in the hands and feet and of the thorns in the head think of the wonderful possibilities in the reversal of these thoughts and this picturing think of what the contemplation of the wonderful work accomplished by the saviour on earth of the constant mental picturing of his glorious life of his tenderness and love for humanity of his power and dignity of his continually outpouring of himself in service think of what the constant holding of such an ideal such a model and the perpetual effort to realize it would do for the race we tend to become like what we admire sympathize with and persistently hold in mind the hero of the great stone face became the counterpart of his ideal the history of christianity is a continuous record of the power of the ideal to raise men and women to their highest power st paul one of the most conspicuous of these examples is so possessed so enthused by the inspiration of his great model that he cries i live not i but christ in me the contemplation of perfection is always uplifting nothing so strengthens a mind enlarges manhood or womanhood widens the thought as the constant effort to measure up to high ideals the struggle to better our best to make our highest moments permanent in the continual reaching of the mind to the things above and beyond the steady pursuit of the ideal which constantly advances as we pursue is what has led the race up from savagery to twentieth-century civilization a great artist was one day found by a friend in tears in his studio when asked the cause of his distress he replied i have produced a work with which i am satisfied and i shall never produce another it is said he never did the inspiration that had urged him on was his ideal that kept him always striving to improve on what he had previously done without it there was nothing to strive for without an ideal there is no growth and where there is no growth there is retrogression without a vision the people perish 
nothing in the universe is static none of us stand still we are all traveling in some direction either forward or backward everything depends on the ideal what we admire and aspire to enters into the very texture of our being becomes part of us if we had the power to analyze any individual we could tell what books he had read could detect the type of his friends and associates could name his heroes that is we could tell what ideals had actuated him parents and teachers should urge upon the young the importance of hero worship of choosing the highest human ideals our lives are modeled chiefly after the pattern of the ideals of our youth and there is no danger of too much hero worship if only the heroes are worthy history is full of examples of the powerful influence of ideals upon our great men it is said that alexander the great always carried a copy of homer's iliad in his pocket and that he never tired of reading about achilles the great hero whom he was ambitious to resemble many a young man in this country who has been inspired encouraged and stimulated by lincoln's career has not only lived a grander life and made a truer success because he molded his life after that of his hero but he has developed many qualities in common with lincoln which otherwise might have lain forever dormant many a young officer in our army is more efficient because of his imitation of grant and lee the ideals which haunted his dreams and which ever urged him up and on it is of the utmost importance to choose our ideal early in life a high and beautiful ideal that should be our pole star the highest and brightest light we know a recent writer says my advice to all those just starting out to travel life's turnpike is don't start until you have your ideal then don't stop till you get it of course we all have ideals of some kind when we are young but how many of us keep them even till middle age what young man has entered into active life without an ideal before him of what he is going to do and how the world is going to be bettered by him what young girl but who leaving school life smiling before her dreams of the ideal love she will find the ideal happy home she will make and the beautiful work she will do in life with the ideal man of her girlish dreams by her side but do the youth and the maiden hold these ideals throughout the years with the strength of conviction that overcomes all difficulties or do they abandon them with the first discouragement and settle down into a commonplace existence with interest in nothing above the material to youth naturally come glorious ideals not only of what one's own life is to be but of what life in general should be the ideal man the ideal woman the ideal social system and with all these is a vague desire or intention to help toward their fulfillment but too often the result of disappointment in the effort to better conditions is first to give up the hope of realizing the ideal and then to abandon the ideal itself here is where the great danger of retrogression comes in unless the ideal be held with tenacity that no failure or disappointment can relax it is apt to fade away after the first ardor of youth is past one of the greatest aids to the preservation of the youthful ideal in all its freshness and beauty is to recall frequently daily the moral heroes who first gave one a glimpse of one's possibilities and aroused one's ambition recall the special books or particular chapters which fired you to emulate some noble character renew yourself mentally by visualizing the life and work of men and women who have wrought nobly for humanity think of the washingtons the franklins the lincolns the emersons the ruskins the florence nightingales the jane adams the susan b anthony's the francis willards and you will be strengthened to resist the debasing influence of the fierce competition for wealth and preferment even for mere subsistence which in so many instances push out of sight the aspirations and ideals of youth keep constantly in mind the grand characters whose achievements aroused you to noble thoughts and endeavor in the springtime of life and your standards will never drop character always develops according to the pattern within us no artist could paint the face of christ with the model of judas before his mental vision no great character can ever be built with low groveling ideals in the mind the constant struggle to measure up to high ideals is the only force in heaven or on earth that can make a life great beautiful and fruitful if we would ever accomplish anything of worth 
if we would ever establish our oneness with the creator and accomplish the work he sent us here to do we must live up to our ideal with eyes fixed on this ideal we must work with heart and hand and brain with a faith that never grows dim with a resolution that never wavers with a patience that is akin to genius we must persevere unto the end for as we advance our ideal as steadily moves upward the situation that has not its duty its ideal as carlyle was never yet occupied by man yes here in this poor miserable hampered despicable actual wherein even thou now standest here or nowhere is thy ideal work it out therefrom and working believe live be free fool the ideal is in thyself never were truer words spoken wrapped up in every human being there are divine energies which if given proper direction will develop the ideal from stage to stage who sees a sculptor at work upon a block of marble sees what appears to be only a mechanical performance but out of sight in the sculptor's brain there is a quiet presence we do not perceive and every movement of the hand is impelled by that shining thought within the brain the presence is the ideal without it he would be a mason through it he becomes an artist the ideal is the real by it we shape our lives as the sculptor shapes the image from the rough marble external means alone will not accomplish this you must lay hold of the eternal principles of the everlasting verities or you never can approach your ideal your first advance toward it lies in what you are doing now in what you are thinking not on some far-off hide in some distant scene or fabled land where longing without endeavor is magically satisfied will we carve out the ideal that haunts our souls but here and now in this poor mean actual here or nowhere is our ideal in the humble valley on the boundless prairie on the farm on sea or on land in workshop store or office wherever there is honest work for the hand and brain of man to do within the circumscribed limits of our daily duties is the field wherein the outworking of our ideal must be wrought your circumstances may be uncongenial says james allen but they shall not long remain so if you but perceive an ideal and strive to reach it you cannot travel within and stand still without here is a youth hard pressed by poverty and labor confined long hours in an unhealthy workshop unschooled and lacking all the arts of refinement but he dreams of better things he thinks of intelligence of refinement of grace and beauty he conceives of mentally builds up an ideal condition of life the vision of a wider liberty and larger scope takes possession of him unrest urges him to action and he utilizes all his spare time and means though small they are to the development of his latent powers and resources very soon so altered has his mind become that the workshop can no longer hold him it has become so out of harmony with his mentality that it falls out of his life as a garment is cast aside and with the growth of opportunities which fill the scope of his expanding powers he passes out of it forever years later we see this youth as a full-grown man we find him a master of certain forces of the mind which he wields with world-wide influence and almost unequalled power in his hands he holds the cords of gigantic responsibilities he speaks and lo lives are changed men and women hang upon his words and remould their characters and sunlike he becomes the fixed and luminous centre round which innumerable destinies revolve he has realized the vision of his youth he has become one with his ideal the curse of the average person is commonness the lack of aspiring ideals there are thousands of farmers who never get above cattle and wheat of doctors who never become superior to prescriptions or diseases of lawyers who never wholly subordinate their briefs the ideals of the masses rarely rise out of mediocrity most of us live in the basement of our lives while the upper stories are all unused millions of human beings never get out of the kitchen of their existence we need aspiration and great thought models to lift us god has whispered into the ear of all existence look up there is potential celestial gravitation in every mortal 
there is a spiritual hunger in humanity which if fed and nourished will lead to the upbuilding and developing of great souls there's a latent divinity in every son of adam which must be aroused before there can be any great progress in individual uplift in a factory where mariners compasses are made before the needles are magnetized they will lie in any position but when once touched by the mighty magnet once electrified by that mysterious power they ever afterwards point only in one direction many a young life lies listless purposeless until touched by the divine magnet after which if it nourishes its aspirations it always points to the north star of its hope and its ideal every faintest aspiration that springs up in our heart is a heavenly seed within us which will grow and develop to rich beauty if only it be fed encouraged the better things do not grow either in material or mental soil without care and nourishment only weeds briars and noxious plants thrive easily the aspiration that is not translated into active effort will die just as any power or function that is not used will atrophy and disappear the ostrich naturalists say once had wonderful wings but not caring to use them preferring to walk on the earth rather than mount in the air it practically lost its wings their strength passing into its legs the giraffe probably once had an ordinary neck like other animals but being long used to reach up to gather its food from the branches of trees it lifted its body up in the upward direction until it is now the tallest of all animals its elongated neck enabling it to gather the leaves from lofty trees something like this takes place continually in human lives we rise or fall by our ideals by our pursuit or our disregard of them the majority of us make bungling work of our living we spend so much precious time and effort catering to the desires of our animal natures and live chiefly along the lines of life's lower aims and opportunities when we might be soaring everywhere we see men making a splendid living but a very poor life succeeding in their vocations but failing as men swerving from their own highest ideals for the sake of making a little more money on every hand we see people sacrificing the higher to the lower dwarfing the best thing in them for a superficial material advantage selling the birthright of the soul's ideal for a mess of pottage is there any reason or intelligence in man's continuing to turn his ability his energies all there is in him into dollars after he has many times more of these than he can ever use for living and betterment is the gift of life so cheap so meaningless of so little importance that we can afford to spend time on things that do not endure upon unnecessary material things which soon pass away to the neglect of those that endure we know that life is our great opportunity to acquit ourselves like men yet it is too often into these transient things that we pour the full force of our energies while we only sigh and wish that we could achieve our ideals we sacrifice much to gain wealth but practically nothing to realize the outreach of our souls yet the ideal is indeed the pearl of great price in the balance with which all that a man hath besides is as nothing the red-letter men of the world have always been men of high ideals to which they were ever loyal men who have said this one thing i do and have put the whole strength of their lives into their effort to realize their ideal if from the start you listen to and obey that something within which urges you to find the road that leads up higher if you listen to and obey the voice which bids you look up and not down which ever calls you on and up no matter what is outward seeming your life cannot be a failure the really successful men and women are those who by the nobility of their example contribute to the uplift the happiness the enlargement of life to the wisdom of the world not those who have merely piled up selfish dollars a rich personality enriches everybody who comes in contact with it everybody who touches a noble life feels ennobled thereby there is machinery so delicate that it can measure the least expenditure of physical force if similar machinery could be devised for measuring character many a millionaire would be chagrined at the record of his own just measurement while many a humble worker would be amazed at the high mark his earnest unceasing efforts to reach his ideal had achieved 
i believe the time will come when not money but growth not lands and houses but mental and moral expansion in larger and nobler living will be even the popular measure of true riches real success the measure of a successful man will be that of his soul he will be rated in a new sort of bradstreet a spiritual bradstreet as a large heart a magnanimous mind a cultured intellect instead of as a great checkbook phillips brooks said the ideal life of full completion haunts us all we feel the thing we ought to be breathing beneath the thing we are god hides some ideal in every human soul some time in his life each feels a trembling fearful longing to do some great good thing life finds its noblest spring of excellence in its hidden impulse to do one's best every one who substitutes the finer for the cheaper goal each one who to-day and every day holds to his high ideal despite the stress and turmoil of modern daily living in such measure hastens the day when such an ideal will be the inspiration of the masses and the power that moves the world how to make the brain work for us during sleep would you not think yourself fortunate to have a secretary of great ability and worth absolutely subject day and night to your will and so susceptible to instructions that even your slightest mental suggestion would be faithfully carried out if you had such a secretary and knew that in spite of his great ability he would be able to do what you suggested only in proportion to your belief in his power to do so would you not be careful to entertain no doubts of his ability to carry out your wishes or suggestions now just substitute for this personal secretary your subconscious self that part of you which is below the threshold of your consciousness and try to realize that this self is actually the sort of secretary i have endeavored to describe capable of carrying out all your desires of executing all your purposes of realizing your ambitions to the exact extent of your belief in its powers and you will get some idea of what it can accomplish for you this secretary is closer to you than your breath nearer than your heartbeat a faithful servant walking by your side all through life to execute your faintest wish to carry out your desires to help you to achieve your aims every bit of help of encouragement of support you give to this other self will add the magnificence the splendor of your destiny on the other hand all negative vicious thoughts all selfishness greed and envy all doubts and fears all the discouraging destructive thoughts you entertain will impair and weaken your secretary or servant in exact proportion to their intensity and persistency in fact it rests with yourself whether your secretary shall be your greatest help a heavenly friend and assistant or your greatest hindrance your worst enemy it doesn't matter what we call them subconscious and conscious self or subjective and objective mind we are all conscious that these are two forces constantly at work in us one commands and the other obeys we know that one of these the subjective mind does not originate its acts but gets its instruction from the objective mind which contains the will power experience shows us that the subjective or subconscious mind which i have called a personal secretary is a servant which obeys our will carries out our wishes and registers in the brain a faithful record not only of every thought word and act of ours but of everything we see and everything we hear others say coleridge tells of a remarkable instance of the truth of this a young german servant girl was taken ill with fever and in her delirium she recited correctly long passages from famous authors in latin greek and hebrew scholars were called in to hear this uneducated girl speaking fluently tongues of which she had no knowledge in her conscious moments and to tell if they could what it meant they were much puzzled and could make nothing of it but later the miracle was explained years before it seems the girl had lived in a minister's family and was accustomed to hear the master recite the classics aloud she had listened attentively and her subconscious mind had faithfully recorded every word in her brain and reproduced what it had heard when the objective mind was quiescent numerous instances might be cited to show that our subconscious mind is the record storehouse of all that has ever happened to us every thought every experience whatever passes before the eye or that we see or hear or feel is registered accurately in our brain by our subconscious mind 
now if this other self personal secretary subconscious mind or whatever we choose to call it has such enormous power why can it not be trained to work for us when we are asleep as well as when we are awake have you ever thought of the possibilities of spiritual and mental development during sleep has it ever occurred to you that while the process of repair and upbuilding are proceeding normally in the body the mind also may be expanding the soul as well as the body may be growing when corporal and voluntary things are quiescent the lord operates said swedenborg the great swedish philosopher was a firm believer in the activity of the other self during sleep he claimed that his spiritual vision was opened in the unconscious hours of the night the bible teems with illustrations of the activity of the subconscious mind or self during sleep warnings are given work is commanded to be done visions are seen plans are outlined angels are conversed with courses of conduct advised and every suggestion made to the soul in the dream state is literally carried out in the waking hours theosophists believe that during sleep the soul or spirit acts independently of the body that it actually leaves the body and goes out into the night to perform tasks appointed by the creator as a matter of fact few people realize what an immense amount of work is carried on automatically in the body under the direction of the subconscious mind if the entire brain and nervous system were to go to sleep at night all of the bodily functions would stop the heart would cease to beat the stomach the liver the kidneys and other glands would no longer act the various digestive processes would cease to operate all the physical organs would cease working and we should stop breathing one of the deepest mysteries of nature's processes is that of putting a part of the brain and nervous system and most of the mental faculties which were in use during the day under the sweet ether of sleep while she repairs and rejuvenates every cell and every tissue but at the same time keeping in the most active condition a great many of the bodily processes and even certain of the mental and creative faculties these are awake and alert all the time while the sleeper is in a state of unconsciousness most of us probably have had the experience of dropping to sleep at night discouraged because we could not solve some vexing problem to our satisfaction it may have been one in mathematics during our school days or later on a weightier one in business or professional life and behold in the morning without any conscious effort on our part the problem was solved all its intricacies were unraveled and what had so puzzled us the night before was perfectly clear when we woke up in the morning our conscious objective self did not enter the mysterious laboratory where the miracle was wrought we do not know how it was wrought we only know it was done somehow without our knowledge while we slept some of our greatest inventions and discoveries have been worked out by the subconscious mind during sleep many an inventor who went to sleep with a puzzled brain discouraged and disheartened because he could not make the connecting link between his theory and its practical application awoke in the morning with his problem solved mathematicians and astronomers have had marvelous results worked out while they slept answers to questions which had puzzled them beyond measure during their waking hours writers poets painters musicians have all received inspiration for their work while the body slumbered many people attempt to explain these things on a purely physical basis they attribute the apparent phenomenon to the mere fact that the brain has been refreshed and renewed during the night and that consequently we can think better and more clearly in the morning that is true so far as it goes but there is something more something beyond this we know that ideas are suggested and problems actually worked out along lines which did not occur to the waking mind most of us have had experiences of some kind or another which show that there is some great principle some intelligent power back of the flesh but not of it which is continually active in our lives helping us to solve our problems one of the most interesting instances of this kind is given in the biography of the great scientist professor louis agassiz by his widow he professor agassiz the writer says had been for two weeks striving to decipher the somewhat obscure impression of a fossil fish on the stone slab in which it was preserved weary and perplexed he put his work aside at last and tried to dismiss it from his mind shortly after he waked one night persuaded that while asleep he had seen this fish with all the missing features perfectly restored 
but when he tried to hold and make fast the image it escaped him nevertheless he went early to the jardin de plant thinking that on looking anew at the impression he should see something which would put him on the track of his vision in vain the blurred record was as blank as ever the next night he saw the fish again but with no more satisfactory result when he woke it disappeared from his memory as before hoping that the same experience might be repeated on the third night he placed a pencil and paper beside his bed before going to sleep accordingly towards morning the fish reappeared in his dream confusedly at first but at last with such distinctness that he had no longer any doubt as to its zoological characters still half dreaming in perfect darkness he traced these characters on the sheet of paper at the bedside in the morning he was surprised to see in his nocturnal sketch features which he thought it impossible the fossil itself should reveal he hastened to the jardin de plantes and with his drawing as a guide succeeded in chiseling away the surface of the stone under which portions of the fish proved to be hidden when wholly exposed it corresponded with his dream and his drawing and he succeeded in classifying it with ease we are all familiar with examples of the marvellous feats performed by somnambulists they will get up and rest while fast asleep lock and unlock doors go out and walk and ride in the most dangerous places where they would not attempt to go when awake many have been known to walk with sure feet along the extreme edges of roofs of houses on the banks of rivers or close to the edge of precipices where one false step would participate them to death they will speak write act and move as if entirely conscious of what they are doing a somnambulist will answer questions put to him while asleep and carry on a conversation rationally in this respect the state of the sleepwalker is similar to that of a person in a hypnotic trance he can be acted on from without and remain wholly unconscious surgical operations have been performed upon a hypnotized person without the use of anesthetics and there is no doubt that this also would be possible during profound sleep the subjective mind is much more susceptible to suggestion when the objective mind is unconscious there is no resistance on account of prejudice or external influences that we are on the eve of marvellous possibilities of treating disease during sleep there is not the slightest doubt the same is true of habit forming mind changing of mind improving of strengthening deficient faculties of eradicating peculiarities and idiosyncrasies of neutralizing injurious hereditary tendencies of increasing ability the possibilities of changing the disposition and of mind building during sleep are only beginning to be realized the power of the subjective mind over the body is well illustrated by the fact that thoughts aroused in a hypnotized person can very materially shift the circulation of the blood they can send it at will to any part of the body the hypnotist can make his subject blush or turn pale express in his face fierce anger or appealing love he can at will produce anesthesia in any part of the body so that a needle or knife may be inserted in the flesh without causing the slightest pain he can also impress the hypnotized person's mind with the belief that the water he drinks is whiskey that he will actually exhibit all the appearance of drunkenness he can make him believe that the spoonful of water he takes is full of poison so that he will immediately develop the symptoms of poisoning the subjective mind is not only capable of carrying out orders but as has already been shown every impression made on it is indelible how often we say when we cannot recall a well-known name or the details of some important event or experience well i cannot think of that now but it will come to me i shall think of it later and how often have the forgotten details flashed into our mind when the occasion has passed and we were thinking of something else again and again we have puzzled our brains at night trying to think of some particular thing which has gone out of our memory only to find it waiting for us in the morning we are beginning to realize that all of our experiences during the day all of our thoughts emotions and mental attitudes the multitude of little things which seem to make but a feeling impression are not in reality lost every day leaves its photographic records on the brain and these records are never erased or destroyed they simply drop into the unconscious mind and are ever on call 
they may not come at once in response to our summons but they are still there and are often many years after they have dropped into the subconscious mind reproduced with their original vividness i heard recently of a prominent banker who lost a very important key the only one to the bank treasures he claimed that it had not been lost in the ordinary way but stolen suspicion at once attached to the employees a prominent detective was placed in the bank and after watching and questioning every one on the staff he became convinced that none but the banker himself knew anything about the key every detective is necessarily something of a mind reader and this one believing firmly in his own theory suggested a simple plan for recovering the key he told the banker to quit suspecting the employees and worrying about burglars getting the bank's treasures to relax his overwrought mind and go to sleep with the belief that he himself had put the key away somewhere and that it would be found in the morning if you do this he said i believe the mystery will be solved the banker to the best of his ability did as the detective suggested and on getting up the following morning he was instinctively led to a certain secret place and behold there was the key he was not conscious that he had put it there but after finding it he had a faint recollection of previously going to this place the banker's objective or conscious mind was probably busy with something else when he put the key away only his subconscious self had any knowledge of what he was doing then when he missed the key his fears his worry his anxiety his suspicions and generally wrought up mental attitude made it impossible for his subjective mind to reveal the secret to him but after his mind had become poised and he was again in tune with his subjective intelligence the information was passed along dr hack took a distinguished english authority on the subject the memory freed from distraction as it sometimes is he says is so vivid as to enable the sleeper to recall events which happened years before and which had been entirely forgotten now as we have seen the subconscious mind can perform real work real service for us why should we not use it especially during sleep why should we not avail ourselves of this enormous creative force to strengthen all our powers and possibilities to peace out virtually to lengthen our time our lives think of what it would mean to us in a lifetime if we could keep these sleepless creative functions always in superb condition so that they would go on during the night working out our problems unraveling our difficulties carrying forward our plans while we sleep we have sufficient proof already to show that they do actual constructive work but the testimony of dr took on this point is of interest that the exercise of thought and this on a high level is consistent with sleep can hardly be doubted he writes arguments are employed in debate which are not always illogical we dreamed one night subsequent to a lively conversation with a friend on spiritualism that we instituted a number of test experiments in reference to it the nature of these tests was retained vividly in the memory after awakening they were by no means wanting in ingenuity and proved that the mental operations were in good form it is now established beyond a doubt that certain parts of the brain continue active during the night when the rest of it is under the anesthetic of sleep but we have hardly begun to realize what a tremendous ally this sleepless creative part of the brain can be in our mental development it is well known that most of the growth of the child of its skeleton muscles nerves and all of the twelve different kinds of tissues in the body takes place during sleep that there is comparatively little during the activities of the day it is not so well understood that our minds also grow during the night that they develop along the lines of the ideals thoughts and emotions with which we feed them before retiring all the analogies go to prove that the mind is always awake says m Chauffre. the mind during sleep is not in a special mood or state but goes on and develops itself absolutely as in the waking hours as a matter of fact we never awake just the same being as when we went to sleep we are either better or worse we changed while we slept while our senses are wrapped in slumber the subjective mind is busily at work it is either building up or tearing down 
it is my firm belief that by an intelligent systematic direction of this sleepless faculty of the brain we can actually make it create for us along the line of our desires as it is most people by not putting the mind in proper condition before going to sleep not only do not intelligently use this marvelous creative agency but they destroy all possibility of beneficial results from its action it is as necessary to prepare the mind for sleep as it is to prepare the body the following chapter offers some suggestions on this point preparing the mind for sleep sleep gentle sleep how have i frightened thee shakespeare not long ago i heard a young lady say that it was impossible for any woman to look charming or to be agreeable right after getting up in the morning the rev dr bushnell declared that a man must be next to a devil who wakes angry the way we feel when we awake in the morning depends on how we were feeling or thinking when we went to sleep if we retire holding a grudge against a neighbor with a resolve to get square with somebody who has injured us if we have hatred or jealousy in our heart if we are envious of another's success and if we go to sleep nursing these feelings we awake in a depressed exhausted state feeling bitter pessimistic irritable unhappy about as nearly like a devil as possible for a human being to feel the destroyer was at work all night running amuck among the delicate brain and nerve cells furiously tearing down what beneficent nature had taken such pains to upbuild but when we take pleasant kindly loving thoughts to bed with us we awake refreshed in a happy contented frame of mind our sleepless faculties spent the hours in upbuilding performing friendly offices for us during the night few people ever think of preparing the mind for sleep yet it is even more necessary than it is to prepare the body most of us take great pains to put the latter in order we undress take a warm bath massage the face with some sort of refreshing salve cold cream or oil we make sure that our sleeping room is properly ventilated and that our bed is clean and comfortable but to the matter of preparing our minds we don't give a thought instead of making our subconscious mental processes build for us in the night we allow them to tear down much of what we have built during the day many of us grow old haggard and wrinkled in the night just when the reverse ought to be the case for nature herself has ordained that night should be the building the renewing time of life if we were only to prepare the mind for sleep with the same intelligence and care that we prepare the body if we were to give it a cleansing mental bath wiping from memory slate all black discordant pictures all the worries and fears which vexed and perplexed us during the day instead of having the nightmare panorama passing and repassing before us during the night robbing us of needed rest and neutralizing our upbuilding recuperative forces what a difference it would make in our achievement in our lives i know men whose lives have been revolutionized by adopting the practice of putting themselves in a harmonious condition getting in tune with the infinite before going to sleep formerly they were in the habit of retiring in a bad mood tired discouraged over anticipated evils worrying about all sorts of things they would discuss their misfortunes at night with their wives and then fall to thinking over the unfortunate condition in their affairs their mistakes and possible evil consequences that might result from them naturally their minds were in an upset condition when they fell asleep and as might have been expected the melancholy black ugly pictures of the misfortunes they feared vividly exaggerated in the stillness of the night became etched deeper and deeper on their brains and did their baleful work making the real rest and reinvigorating absolutely impossible when they reformed their habits changed their thought and retired in a peaceful frame of mind with the intention of going to sleep instead of tossing about thinking of their troubles their business straight away began to improve they were stronger fresher more vigorous more resourceful better able to cope with difficulties to make plans and carry them out than when they were depleting their physical and mental resources by robbing themselves of their best friend nature's restorative sleep many people tell me they cannot stop thinking after they go to bed their brains are so active doing their next day's work that they cannot stop the mental processes for hours of course you cannot stop all thinking the first night you begin to form the new habit 
when you have practiced the old night thinking habit for years when perhaps as far back as you can remember you have gone to bed every night worrying worrying thinking thinking planning planning ahead for days for weeks for months planning ahead perhaps for the coming year but if you persist and make it a cast-iron rule to allow no anxieties or fears no business troubles or discords of any kind to enter your bedchamber you will succeed in accomplishing your object think of your chamber as the one place sacred to rest where the things that trouble and harass and vex during the daytime shall find no entrance put this legend over the door or in some conspicuous place where you can see it this is my holy of holies the place of supreme peace and power in my life from which all discord must be shut out when you undress and lie down say to yourself i have done my best during the day now i'm going to drop thinking drop worrying and planning and get good refreshing sleep to prepare me for tomorrow's work clear your mind not only of all anxious worrying business thoughts but also of all ill will or hatred toward another resolve that you will not harbor an unpleasant bitter or unkind thought of any human being that you will wipe off the slate of your memory everything you have ever had against any one that you will forget whatever is unpleasant in the past and start with a clean slate just imagine the words harmony peace love good will to every living creature are emblazoned in letters of light all over the walls of your room repeat them over and over until that other self that personal secretary just below the threshold of your consciousness become saturated with the ideas they convey and after a while you will drop into slumber with a serene poised mind a mind filled with happy joyous creative thoughts of course until a new habit is fixed thoughts will intrude themselves in spite of you but you needn't harbor them you needn't allow yourself under any circumstances to go on thinking about business or any discordant thing after you retire any more than you would allow a madman to slash you with a knife without making an attempt to defend yourself you can if you only persist in the new and better way fall asleep every night like a tired child and awake in the morning just as refreshed and happy your subconscious self will after a while carry out your behests without any conscious effort on your part this sleepless subconscious self is in fact one of the most effective agents man has to help him accomplish whatever he desires insomnia for instance which is the curse of so many americans may be entirely overcome by its aid if you are a victim of insomnia and go to bed every night with the thought firmly fixed in your consciousness that you are not going to sleep you are to a great extent the victim of your belief the conviction in your subconscious mind that there is something the matter with your sleeping ability is largely responsible for the continuance of your trouble we know by experience that we can convince ourselves of almost anything by affirming it long enough and often enough the constant repetition after a while establishes the belief in our minds that the thing is true we can establish the sleep habit just as easily as any other habit it is perfectly possible by means of affirmation the constant repetition in heart-to-heart -heart talks with yourself to regain your power to sleep normally your subconscious self that side of your nature which presides over the involuntary or automatic functions during sleep as well as while you are awake as for instance walking and other things which do not require volition of the mind or special will power can be made to obey your commands or rather suggestions to overcome insomnia say to this inner self you know there is no reason why you should not sleep there is no defect in your physical or mental makeup which keeps you awake you ought to sleep soundly so many hours every night there is no reason why you should not and you are going to do so tonight repeat similar affirmations during the day say to yourself this sleeplessness is only a bad habit if you were ill physically or mentally if you had any serious defect in your nervous system which would give you an excuse for insomnia it would be a different thing but you haven't anything of the sort you are simply the slave of senseless obsession and you are going to break it up you are going to begin right away you are going to sleep better tonight tomorrow night and the next night 
you are going to get through with this boogie you have built up in your imagination which has no existence in reality nothing keeps you awake but your conviction your fear that you are not going to sleep prepare your mind for sleep in the way already suggested by emptying it of all worry and fear all envy and uncharitableness everything that disturbs irritates or excites crowd these out with thoughts of joy of good cheer of things which will help and inspire compose yourself with the belief that you will go to sleep easily and naturally relax every muscle and say to yourself in a quiet drowsy voice i am so sleepy so sleepy so sleepy the subconscious self will listen and in a short time will automatically put your suggestion into practice it is needless to say that if insomnia is a result of bad or irregular habits the victim must first change all his habits before he can expect any relief man is a bundle of habits we perform most of our life functions with greater or less regularity so that they become practically automatic regularity system order are imperative for our health our success and our happiness this is especially true in regard to sleep we must sleep regular hours be systematic in our habits or our sleep is likely to suffer if you play as hard as you work refresh and rejuvenate yourself by pleasant recreation and a jolly good time when your work is done and then at a regular hour every night prepare your mind for sleep just as you would prepare your body give it a mental bath and clothe it in beautiful thoughts you will in a short time establish the habit of sound peaceful refreshing sleep whatever else you do or do not form the habit of making a call on the great within of yourself before retiring leave there the message of uplift of self-betterment and self-enlargement that which you yearn for and long to realize but do not know just how to attain registering this call this demand for something higher and nobler in your subconsciousness putting it right up to yourself will work like a leaven during the night and after a while all the building forces within you will unite and further you in your aim in helping you to realize your vision whatever it may be the period of sleep may be made a wonderful period of growth for the mind as well as for the body it is a time when you can attract your desires it is a propitious time to nurse your vision instead of making an enemy of your subconscious self by giving it destructive thoughts to work with explosives that will destroy much of what you have accomplished during the day make it your friend by giving it strong creative helpful thoughts with which to go on creating building for you during the night there are marvelous possibilities for health and character success and happiness building during sleep every thought dropped into the subconscious mind before we go to sleep is a seed that will germinate in the night while we are unconscious and ultimately bring forth a harvest of its kind by impressing upon it our desires picturing as vividly as possible our ideals what we wish to become and what we long to accomplish we will be surprised to see how quickly that wonderful force in the subjective self will begin to shape the pattern to copy the model which it is given in this way we can correct habits which are wounding our self-respect humiliating us marring our usefulness and efficiency perhaps sapping our lives we can get rid of faults and imperfections we can strengthen our weak faculties and overcome vicious tendencies which the will-power may not be strong enough to correct in the daytime if as now seems clear the subconscious mind can build or destroy can make us happy or miserable according to the pattern we give it before going to sleep if it can solve the problems of the inventor of the discoverer of the troubled business man why do we not use it more why do we not avail ourselves of this tremendous mysterious force for life building character building success building happiness building instead of for life destroying one reason is that we are only just beginning to discover that we can control this secondary self or intelligence which regulates all the functions of the body without the immediate orders of the objective self we are getting a glimpse of what it is capable of doing by experiments upon hypnotized subjects when the objective mind the mind which gets most of its material through the five senses is shut off and the other the subjective mind is in control 
we are finding that it is comparatively easy while a person is in a hypnotic state to make wonderful changes in disposition and to correct vicious habits mental and moral defects through suggestion there is no doubt that so far as the subjective mind is concerned we are in a similar condition when asleep as when in a hypnotic trance and experiments have shown that marvelous results are possible especially in the case of children by talking to them during their sleep advising them counseling them suggesting things that are for their good parents should teach their children how to prepare their minds for sleep so that the subconscious self would create produce something beautiful instead of the black discordant images of fear which so often terrorize little ones before they fall asleep and when they wake up in the dark hours of the night how often have we noticed the troubled fearful expression on the face of a sleeping child who was sent to bed with anger thoughts with fear thoughts in its mind after a severe scolding or perhaps a whipping a child should never be scolded or frightened or teased especially just before bedtime it should be encouraged to fall asleep in its sweetest happiest mood in the spirit of love then its sleeping face will reflect the love spirit and the child will awaken in the same spirit as though it had been talking with angels while it slept children are peculiarly susceptible to the influence of our thoughts our suggestions to them during sleep their character can be molded to a great extent their ability developed their faults eradicated and their weak points strengthened during sleep in some ways the suggestions made to them in that state have more effect than those made to them when awake because while the objective mind often scatters and fails to reproduce what is presented to it the subjective mind gradually absorbs and reflects every suggestion many mothers have found this true especially in correcting bad habits which seemed almost impossible to reach while the children were awake if you want to make your child beautiful in character in disposition in person think beautiful thoughts into its mind as it falls asleep speak to it of beautiful things while it sleeps i believe the time will come when much of the child's training will be affected during sleep its aesthetic faculties the love of music of art of all things noble and beautiful special talents and latent possibilities of all kinds will be developed through suggestion in the marvelous interior creative forces lies the great secret of life and blessed is he who findeth it doubly blessed is he who findeth it at the start of life how to stay young we do not count a man's years until he has nothing else to count r w emerson the ability to hold mentally the picture of youth in all its glory vivacity and splendor has a powerful influence in restraining the old age process old age begins in the heart when the heart grows cold the skin grows old and the appearance of age impress themselves on the body the mind becomes blighted the ideals blurred and the juices of life congealed many people look forward to old age as a time when as a recent writer puts it you have a feeling that no one wants you that all those you have borne and brought up have long passed out on to roads where you cannot follow that even the thought life of the world streams by so fast that you lie up in a backwater feebly blindly groping for the full of the water and always push gently hopelessly back there is such a thing as old age of this kind but not for those who face life in the right way such a pathetic such a tragic ending is not for those who love and are loved because they keep their hearts open to the joys and sorrows of life who maintain a sympathetic interest in their fellow beings and in the progress and uplift of the world who keep their faculties sharpened by use and whose minds are constantly reaching out broadening and growing in the love and service of humanity a dismal useless old age is only for those who have not learned how to live growth in knowledge and wisdom should be the only indication of our added years professor mitchnikoff the greatest authority on age believes that it is possible to prolong life with its maximum of vigor and freshness until the end of its normal cycle when the individual will gratefully welcome what will be a perfectly happy release at this point he claims that the instinct of death will supplant the instinct of life when the bodily mechanism approaches the natural end of normal exhaustion he believes that men should live and maintain their usefulness for at least one hundred and twenty years 
the author of philosophy of longevity tells us that man can live to be two hundred years old jean finot says speaking physiologically the human body possesses peerless solidity not one of the machines invented by man could resist for a single year the incessant taxes which we impose upon ours yet it continues to perform its functions notwithstanding what we have a horror of is the premature death of the faculties the cutting off of power opportunity the decay of the body many years before the close of life on earth we shudder at the giving up of a large part of life that has potency of work of action and of happiness this horror of senility increases because life continually grows more interesting there never was a time when it seemed so precious so full of possibilities when there was so much to live for as in this glorious present there never was a time when it seemed so hard to be forced out of the life race we are on the eve of a new and marvellous era and the whole race is on the tiptoe of expectancy never before was the thought of old age as represented by decay and enforced inactivity so repugnant to man but why should any one look forward to such a period it is just this looking forward the anticipating and dreading the coming of old age that makes us old senile and useless the creative forces inside of us build on our suggestions on our thought models and if we constantly thrust into our consciousness old age thoughts and pictures of decrepitude of declining faculties these thoughts and pictures will be reproduced in the body a few years ago a young man died of old age in a new york hospital after an autopsy the surgeon said that while the man was in reality only twenty-three years old he was internally eighty if you have arrived at an age which you accept as a starting point for physical deterioration your body will sympathize with your conviction your walk your gait your expression your general appearance and even your acts will all fall into line with your mental attitude a short time ago i was talking with a remarkable man of sixty about growing old the thought of the inevitableness of the aging process appalled him no matter he declared what efforts he might make to avert or postpone the decrepitude of age there would come a period of diminishing returns and though he might fight against it he would ever after be on the decline of life going irrevocably toward the sunset even nearer and nearer to the time when he should be useless the conviction that every moment every hour every day takes me so much nearer to that hole in the ground from which no power in heaven or earth can help us to escape is ever present in my mind he said this progressive ever active retrogression is monstrous this inevitable decrepit old age staring me in the face is robbing me of happiness paralyzing my efforts and discouraging my ambition but why do you dwell on these things that terrify you i asked why do you harbor such old age thoughts why are you visualizing decrepitude the dulling and weakening of your mental faculties if you have such a horror of decrepitude the loss of memory the failing eyesight the hesitating step and the general deterioration which you believe accompany old age why don't you get away from these terrifying thoughts put them out of your mind instead of dwelling on them don't you know that what you concentrate on what you fear the pictures that so terrify you are creating the very conditions which you would give anything to escape if you really wish to stay the old age processes you must change your thoughts erase everything that has to do with age from your mind visualize youthful conditions say to yourself god is my life i cannot grow old in spirit and that is the only age to fear as long as my spirit is youthful as long as the boy in me lives i cannot age the great trouble with those who are getting along in years is that they put themselves outside of the things that would keep them young most people after fifty begin to shun children and youth generally they feel that it is not becoming to their years to act as they did when younger and day by day they gradually fall more and more into old age ways and habits we build into our lives the picture patterns which we hold in our minds this is a mental law when you have reached the time at which most people show traces of their age you imagine that you must do the same you begin to think that you probably have done your best work and that your powers must henceforth decline you imagine that your faculties are deteriorating that they are not quite so sharp as they once were that you cannot endure quite so much 
and that you ought to begin to let up a little to take less exercise to do less work to take life a little easier the moment you allow yourself to think your powers are beginning to decline they will do so and your appearance and bodily conditions will follow your convictions if you hold the thought that your ambition is sagging that your faculties are deteriorating you will be convinced that younger men have the advantage of you and voluntarily at first you will begin to take a back seat figuratively speaking behind the younger men once you do this you are doomed to be pushed farther and farther to the rear you will be taken at your own valuation having made a confession of age acknowledged in thought and act that in so far as work and productive returns are concerned you are no longer the equal of young men they will naturally be preferred before you if people who have aged prematurely could only analyze the influences which have robbed them of their birthright of youth they would find that most of them were a false conviction that they must grow old at about such a time needlessly worry all worry is needless silly anxiety which often comes from vanity jealousy and the indulgence of such passions as excessive temper revenge and all sorts of unhealthy thinking if they could only eliminate these influences from their lives they would take a great leap back toward youthfulness if it were possible to erase all of the scars and wrinkles all the effects of our aging thoughts aging emotions moods and passions many of us would be so transformed so rejuvenated that our friends would scarcely know us aging thoughts and moods and passions make old men and women of most of us in middle life the laws of renewal of rejuvenation are always operating in us and will be effective if we do not neutralize them by wrong thinking the chemical changes caused in the blood and other secretions by worry fear the operation of the explosive passions or by any depressing mental disturbance will put the aging process in action whatever we establish as a fixed conviction in our lives we transmit to our children and this conviction gathers cumulative force all the way down the centuries every child in christian countries is born with the race belief that threescore years or threescore years and ten is a sort of a measure of the limit to human life this has crystallized into a race belief and we begin to prepare for the end much in advance of the period fixed as long as we hold this belief we cannot bar out of our minds the consequent suggestion that when we pass the half-century limit our powers begin to decline the very idea that we have reached our limit of growth that any hope of further progress must be abandoned tends to etch the old age picture and conviction deeper and deeper in our minds and of course the creative processes can only produce the pattern given them some men cross the zenith line from which they believe they must henceforth go downhill a quarter of a century or more earlier than others because we cross this line of demarcation mentally first cross it when we are convinced that we have passed the maximum of our producing power and have reached the period of diminishing returns many people have what they are pleased to call a premonition that they will not live beyond a certain age and that becomes a focus toward which the whole life points they begin to prepare for the end their conviction that they are to die at a certain time largely determines the limitation of their years not long since at a banquet i met a very intelligent widely read man who told me that he felt perfectly sure he could not possibly live to be an old man he cited as a reason for his belief the analogy which runs through all nature showing that plants animals and all forms of life which mature early also die early and because he was practically an adult at fifteen he was convinced that he must die comparatively young he said he was like a poplar tree in comparison with an oak the one matured early and died early the other matured late and was very long lived so thoroughly this man was under the dominion of his belief that he must die early that he is making no fight for longevity he does not take ordinary care of his health or necessary precautions in time of danger what's the use he says of trying to fight against nature's laws i might as well live while i live enjoy all i can and try to make up for an early death multitudes of people start out in youth handicapped by a belief that they have some hereditary taint a predisposition to some disease that will probably shorten their lives they go through life with this restricting limiting thought so deeply embedded in the very marrow of their being 
that they never even try to develop themselves to their utmost capacity our achievement depends very largely on the expectancy plan the life pattern we make for ourselves if we make our plan to fit only one half or one third of the time we ought to live naturally we will accomplish only a fraction of what we are really capable of doing i have a friend who from boyhood has been convinced that he would not live much if any beyond forty years because both of his parents had died before that age consequently he never planned for a long life of steady growth and increasing power and the result is he has not brought anything like all of his talent possibilities into activity or accomplished a fourth of what he is really capable it is infinitely better to believe that we are going to live much longer than there is any possibility we shall than to cut off precious years by setting a fixed date for our death simply because one or both of our parents happen to die about such an age or because we fear we have inherited some disease such as cancer which is likely to develop fatally at about a certain time just think of the pernicious influence upon a child's mind at the constant suggestion that it will probably die very young because its parents or some of its relatives did that even if it is fortunate enough to survive the diseases and accidents of youth and early maturity it is not possible to extend its limits of life much if any beyond a certain point yet we burn this and similar suggestions into the minds of our children until they become a part of their lives we celebrate birthdays and mark off each reoccurring anniversary as a red-letter day and fix in our minds the thought that we are a year older all through our mature life the picture of death is kept in view the idea that we must expect it and prepare for it at about such a time the truth is the death suggestion has wrought more havoc and marred more lives than almost anything else in human history it is responsible for most of the fear which is the greatest curse of the race a noted physician says that if children instead of hearing so much about death were trained more in the principles of immortality they would retain their youth very much longer and would extend their lives to a much greater length than is now general i believe the time will come when the custom of celebrating birthdays of emphasizing the fact that we are a year older that we are getting so much nearer the end will be done away with children will not then be reminded so forcibly once in three hundred and sixty-five days that each birthday is a milestone in age we shall know that the spirit is not affected by years that its very essence is youth and immortality in our inmost souls we shall realize that there is a life principle within us that knows neither age nor death we shall find that old age is largely a question of mental attitude and that we shall become what we are convinced we must become as a matter of fact the average length of life is steadily increasing because science is teaching men how to live so as to conserve health and youth formerly men and women grew old very much earlier than they do now and they died much younger we do not think so much about dying as they used to in the early days of this country when to prepare for the future life seemed to be the chief occupation of our puritan ancestors they had very little use for this world and did not try to enjoy life here very much they were always talking and praying and singing about the life over there while making the life here gloomy and forbidding they forgot that the religion christ taught was one of joy there is no greater foe to the aging process than joy hope good cheer gladness these are the incarnation of youthful spirit if you would keep young cultivate the spirit think youthful thoughts live much with youth enter into their lives into their sports their plays their ambitions play the youthful part not half-heartedly but with enthusiasm and zest you cannot use any ability until you think until you believe you can your reserve power will stand in the background until your self-faith calls it into action if you want to stay young you must act as if you felt young if you do not wish to grow old quit thinking and acting as if you were aging instead of walking with drooped shoulders and with a slow dragging gait straighten up and put elasticity into your steps do not walk like an old man whose energies are waning whose youthful fires are spent step with the springiness of a young man full of life spirit and vigor the body is not old until the mind gives consent stop thinking of yourself as an old man or an old woman 
cease manifesting symptoms of decrepitude remember that the impression that you make upon others will react upon yourself if other people get the idea that you are going downhill physically and mentally you will have all the more to overcome in your effort to change their convictions when we are ambitious to obtain a certain thing and our hearts are set on it we strive for it we contact with it mentally and through our thoughts we become vitally related to it we establish a connection with the coveted object in other words we do everything in our power to obtain it and the mental effort is a real force which tends to match our dream with its realization an up-to-date modern woman is a good example of what i mean she does not act like an old lady and does not put on an old lady's garb after she has passed the half-century milestone we do not see the old lady's cap the old lady's gown of the past any more women getting along in years nowadays dress more youthfully and appear younger than their grandmothers did at the same age they do everything to make themselves appear young men are much more likely than women to grow careless in regard to their personal appearance as they grow older they wear their hair longer they let their beard grow they stoop their shoulders drag their feet when they walk and begin to neglect their dress they are not as careful in any respect to retain their youthful appearance as women who resort to all sorts of expedients to ward off the signs of age and to retain their attractiveness the habit of growing old must be combated as we combat any other vicious habit by reversing the process by which it is formed instead of surrendering and giving up to old age convictions and fears stoutly deny them and affirm the opposite when the suggestion comes to you that your powers are waning that you cannot do what you once did prove its falsity by exercising the faculties which you think are weakening giving up is only to surrender to age we tend to find what we look for in this world and if as we advance in years we are always looking for signs of old age we will find them if you are constantly on the alert for symptoms of failing faculties you will discover plenty of them and the danger of this is that we are apt to take our unfortunate moods for permanent symptoms that is some day perhaps you cannot think as clearly you cannot concentrate your mind as well you do not remember as readily as you did the day before and you immediately jump to the conclusion that a man of your age must begin to fail cannot expect as much of himself as when he was younger in other words a person whose mind is concentrated upon his aging processes is inclined to draw a wrong conclusion from his temporary moods and feelings mistaking them for permanent conditions the majority of people who are showing the signs of premature aging are suffering from chronic thought poison that is the chronic old age poison from the cradle they have heard old age talk the reiteration of the old age belief that when a person reached about such an age he would then naturally begin to let up to prepare for the end and so instead of fighting off age by holding the eternal youth thought and vigor thought they have held the thoughts of weakness and declining powers when they begin to forget something they say their memory is beginning to go back on them their sight will soon begin to fail and they will go on anticipating signs of decline and decrepitude until the old age visualization is built into the very structure of their bodies instead of forming the habit of looking for signs of age form the habit of looking for signs of youth form the habit of thinking of your body as robust and supple and your brain as strong and active never allow yourself to think that you are on the decline that your faculties are on the wane that they are not as sharp as they used to be and that you cannot think as well because your cells are becoming old and hard he ages who thinks he ages he keeps young who believes he is young we get a good hint of the power of mental influence in the marvelous way in which many of our actresses and grand opera singers retain their youthfulness because they feel that it is imperative that they should do so had sarah bernhardt adelina patty lily lehman madame schumann hink lillian russell and scores of other actresses and singers pursued any other vocation they would undoubtedly have been at least ten perhaps twenty years older in appearance than they are there are too many exceptions to the race belief that man's powers begin to wane at fifty sixty or seventy to allow oneself to be influenced by it we really ought to do our best to work after fifty 
if the brain is kept alive fresh and young and the brain cells are not ruined by a vicious life worry fear selfishness or by disease introduced by wrong living or thinking the mind will constantly increase in vigor and power men and women whose faculties are sharp and whose minds are keen and vigorous at ninety and even a hundred prove this i know a number of men in their seventies and eighties who are as sturdy and vigorous physically and mentally to-day as they were twenty years ago only recently i was talking with a business man who broke down at forty from overstrain but who is now in his eightieth year more buoyant and elastic in mind and body than many men at fifty this man does not believe in growing old because he knows that ten years ago he did not have a bit of the cell material in his body that he has to-day why should i stamp this new body cells with fourscore years he says when not a single one of them may be a quarter of that age many of us do not realize the biological fact that nature herself bestows upon us the power of perpetual renewal there is not a cell in our bodies that can possibly become very old because all of them are frequently renewed physiologists tell us that the tissue cells from some muscles are renewed every few months some authorities estimate that eighty or ninety per cent of all the cells in the body of a person of ordinary activity are entirely renewed within a couple of years one's mental attitude however is the most important of all there's no possible way of keeping young while convinced that one must inevitably manifest the characteristics of old age the old age thoughts stamp themselves upon the new body cells so that they very soon look forty fifty sixty or seventy years old we should hold tenaciously the conviction that none of the cells of the body can be old because they are constantly being renewed a large part of them every few months it is impossible for the processes producing senility to get control of the system or to make very serious changes in the body unless the mind first gives its consent age is not so much a matter of years as of the limpidity the suppleness of protoplasm in the cells of the body and there is nothing which will age the protoplasm like aging thoughts and serenity enemies such as worry anxiety fear anger hatred revenge or any discordant emotion if you keep your protoplasm young by holding your youthful ideals there is no reason why you should not live well into the teens of your second century constantly affirm i am young because i am perpetually renewed my life comes new every instant from the infinite source of life i am new every morning and fresh every evening because i live move and have my being in him who is the source of all life not only affirm this mentally but also audibly make this picture of perpetual rejuvenation and recreation so vivid that you will feel the thrill of youthful renewal through your entire system some people try to cure the physical ravages made by wrong living and wrong thinking by patching their bodies from the outside the beauty parlors in our great cities are besieged by women who are desperately trying to maintain their youthful appearance not realizing that the elixir of youth is in one's own mind not in bottles or boxes is there anything quite so ghastly as to see an old lady really old because her heart is no longer young with a painted or enameled face dressed like a young girl such a woman deceives no one but herself other people can see the old dry skin beneath the rouge they can see the wrinkles which she tries to disguise she cannot cover up her age with such frivolous pretenses the painting of cheeks the wearing of girlish frocks do not make a person young it is largely a question of the age of the mind if the mind has become hardened dry uninteresting if there is no charm in the personality one is old no matter what his or her years count idle selfish women of wealth who live an animal life who are constantly doing things which hasten the appearance of old age overeating over drinking over sleeping idling life away having nothing to do but gratify every luxurious whim are the best customers of beauty doctors who try to erase the marks of old age by treating the skin and hair doctoring the effects instead of trying to remove the cause of old age has never been and can never be really successful you cannot repair the ravages of age on the outside you must remove the cause which is in the mind in the heart when the afflictions are marbleized 
when one ceases to be sympathetic and helpful and interested in life the ravages of old age will appear in spite of all the beauty doctors in the world i know indolent wives of rich men who cannot understand why they age so rapidly in appearance when living such easy carefree worry-free lives they are puzzled to know why it is when they do not have to work when they have no cares when their wants are all supplied without any effort of theirs they do not retain their youthful appearance many years longer than they do the fact is those women stagnate and nothing ages one faster than mental and physical stagnation work useful employment of some sort is the price of all real growth of all real human expansion he or she who indulges in continuous idleness pays the price in constant deterioration physical mental and moral a ship lying idle in the wharf will rot and go to destruction much more rapidly than a ship at sea in constant use every force in nature seems to combine in corroding destroying the unused thing the idle person work love kindness sympathy helpfulness unselfish interest these are the eternal youth essences these never age and if you make friends with them they will act like a leaven in your life enriching your nature sweetening and ennobling your character and prolonging your youth even to the century mark we are learning that the fabled fountain of youth lies in ourselves is in our own mentality perpetual rejuvenation and renewal are possible through right thinking we look as old as we think and feel because thought and feeling maintain or change our appearance in exact accordance with their persistence or their variations it is impossible to appear youthful and remain young unless we feel young youthful thinking should be a life habit our oneness with infinite life he lives best and most who gives god his greatest opportunity in him if we only knew how to live and move and have our being in him to be conscious of this very instant we should then know what true living means we should be satisfied for we should then awake in his likeness deep within every heart that has not dulled the sense of its inner vision is the belief that we are one with some great unknown unseen power and we are somehow inseparably connected with the infinite consciousness it is a mental law that thoughts and convictions can only attract their kind a hatred thought is a hatred magnet and the longer we harbor it the more steadily we contemplate it focus our minds upon it the larger and more powerful the hatred magnet becomes in the early days of the great european war a jewish soldier in the first line of a russian battalion engaged in a man-to-man -man fight with an austrian in the opposing battalion in their desperate encounter the russian jew drove his bayonet through the breast of his opponent as the latter an austrian jew fell mortally wounded with his dying breath he gasped the hebrew prayer which begins hear o israel the russian realizing that he had killed a brother jew overcome with horror fell fainting on the battlefield when he regained consciousness he was a raving lunatic when will men realize that we are all brothers that we are all members of the same great human family children of the same great father mother god when will we see though oceans and continents divide us though we may speak different tongues may differ in race color and creed yet we are so closely related in thought and motive that our deepest most vital interests are identical time and again despite all outward differences has that invisible bond of union which binds mankind to one great family manifested itself even on the battlefield there men who have sabred or shot at and wounded each other have become fast friends and learned to feel their brotherhood many and many a time has it happened that soldiers who had been bitter enemies in battle and had tried in every way to kill each other have found while convalescing side by side that they were really one in sympathy and feeling brothers at heart and did not know it if these men had known and seen into one another's soul before the battle as they had afterwards in the hospital they never could have been induced to fire at or try to injure one another in spite of our failures our blunders our crimes the nations are coming closer and closer together scientific discoveries marvelous inventions the extended use of steam and electricity the conquest of the air all these are fast welding the interests of mankind and bringing into close and intimate relation the most distant countries of the globe 
the occident and the orient are no longer at the ends of the earth they are beginning to know and to respect each other and to learn each from the other they are beginning to realize in its largest sense the truth of kipling's utterance there is neither east nor west border nor breed nor birth when two strong men stand face to face though they come from the ends of the earth scientists are piling up proof after proof of the unity not only of mankind but of everything in the universe the oneness of all life they are demonstrating that there is but one substance one eternal force or essence in the universe and that all we see is but a varying expression of it everything about us is merely a modification a change of form of its universal substance just as electricity is manifestation of force in various forms in its unchained power in rendering giant trees and destroying huge buildings and as harnessed by man in moving trains in lighting homes in furnishing heat for cooking and in many other domestic and industrial devices the lesson of lessons for us to learn from this is our inseparable union with the creator of life that everlasting eternal unity of spirit that oneness with the father which christ came to teach i and the father are one i am the vine ye are the branches we are as closely united one to the other and all to the father as are the branches to the parent stem when we are conscious of our union of our co-partnership with the infinite we feel an added power just as the branch feels the force of life currents flowing into it from the vine severed from the parent stem the same branch would not feel so confident it would soon find that of itself it could do nothing and in a short time it would wither and die the moment we pluck a flower from its stem it begins to wilt and fade because it is separated from the source of its life cut off from the great chemical laboratory of nature from the creative miracle working energy of the sun the soil and the atmosphere it dies within a few hours the moment we are cut off from our divine source we begin to wither shrivel and die as long as we remain separate nothing can stop this fatal blighting process when we are not fed from our source we are like the branch severed from the parent vine like the flower plucked from its mother stem my experience has shown that people who from different causes feel cut off from connection with the divine source of things suffer intensely from fear they are filled with a vague but overmastering terror which presses upon them with greater force because it is unseen unknown they dimly feel that like meteors in the sky which have passed beyond the controlling gravity governing the other heavenly bodies they are separate unrelated human atoms without assurance that they are under a protective guiding sustaining power victims of extreme nervous diseases are often overwhelmed with a sense of utter isolation of being cut off from every sustaining force and they are terror-stricken just as a child who has lost its way and knows not where to turn temporarily and in a lesser degree people who are terrified in a thunderstorm and rush to a cellar anywhere to hide themselves from the threatened danger suffer from this feeling of separation of aloneness all who are affected in this way would be greatly benefited by dwelling on such biblical passages as in him we live and move and have our being the father in me and i in the father these are strictly scientific truths we could not live or move or have any being apart from the power that made us that sustains and supports us and the consciousness of this gives a steadying buttressing sense of security and safety that nothing else can our individual strength comes from our conscious oneness with omnipotence just as our national or corporate strength is derived from union with one another each human being is like a drop of water in the ocean he is not independent he cannot work alone consciously or unconsciously he is a part of the masses all around him he is touched by the other water drops on every side and his existence his success is largely dependent upon his union with the others even if a drop of the ocean could separate itself from the mass and should try to live its own life in its own way it would soon cease to be as a drop a man cannot accomplish much alone his success depends on his union with other men his dignity and strength are reinforced by the organization or association of which he is a unit as a cable is reinforced by the sum of the strength of its separate wires nature says humboldt 
is unity in diversity of manifestation one stupendous whole animated by the breath of life when we come into the conscious realization of the truth that we are a part the most important part of the stupendous whole created by god and that we are working in cooperation with him we will come into possession of a power and dignity which will make our lives sublime the greatest minds of all ages have drawn their strength from the invisible source from their vital connection with a power which creates and works through every one of us they have also believed in the great mission of the race believed in a divine plan running through the universe which works for righteousness and shapes the destiny of the race this faith in the godward movement of the great human current has characterized even those who did not openly profess any religious faith their belief in the divinity of humanity has been a strong factor in their character and the root source of their power this same faith this unquestioned confidence in the divine cosmic intelligence has given more comfort has brought more peace of mind and happiness to vast multitudes of human beings than any other thing indeed it is the only thing that can bring us true peace enduring happiness there is something beside brain force needed to make a man a real constructive power in the world and that is his divine connection his being in the current which runs godward without this essential notwithstanding all that the mind and the body can do for us we feel a void in our being a great lack a longing a yearning for something we know not what without this even though we have the most complete physical and mental equipment we are like a new electric car ready for service thoroughly equipped in every detail except the trolley pole which makes the connection with the electric current completion satisfaction divine energy can only come from attuning ourselves to something beyond the physical and the mental plane we must put up our trolley pole and tap the infinite source of power or else we are so far as true progress is concerned in the position of the car that is not connected with the motor force that alone gives it power to move forward we must tap the divine current running godward through contemplation through prayer through noble deeds unselfish service honest endeavor to live up to our best we cannot make connection with the divine power through any selfish cause any greedy deed it is a strange thing that human beings will take the chances of cutting themselves off from this mighty current which runs truthward justiceward and godward and try to make a substitute of their own puny strength yet every time we consciously do wrong every time we depart from the truth every time we commit a dishonest unworthy act do a mean contemptible thing we separate ourselves from this current and lessen the omnipotent grip upon us we break our connection and become prey to all sorts of fears and doubts someone has truly said that when a man has committed an evil act he has attached himself to sorrow because of the unity of all life he has established relationship between himself and the whole human current of vicious influences he has made connection with all the forces of the universe that conspire to drag him down to draw him still further away from the creator and inspirer of all good the converse is equally true let a man do a good deed commit himself to a noble work and all the creative uplifting forces will rush to his aid he will be reinforced by the added power of all others working in the same spirit on the same plane all good things vibrate in unison they belong to the same family so all bad things vibrate in unison and belong to one family attract one of them and you attract all the others because they are on the same plane a discouraged despondent mood for example makes connection with the whole discouraged and despondent family the whole failure army and when we make this connection our entire being is adjusted to the gloomy discouraged vibration if we harbor the poverty thought the fear of coming to want we unite ourselves with all the poverty vibrations in the universe and whatever has an affinity with poverty rushes towards us through the current we have established on the self-same principle let one think cheerful optimistic thoughts let him make connections with the current of opulence of the generous overflowing abundant supply of the creator and he allies himself with all the healthful productive creative forces in existence 
at one time it was thought that we could get no knowledge or impressions excepting through the five senses but we know now that there are many other avenues by which we communicate with one another there is a mental a spiritual communication which is more intimate more real than any we can make by physical contact or expression we can sit beside those who are in sympathy with us for hours without touching them without a word being spoken without a look and yet enjoy the sweetest and most delightful converse we are conscious that our minds are intercommunicating in a deeper more subtle satisfying manner than is possible by means of physical contact or through the senses in fact there are many occasions in life so sacred that we feel mere words would profane distress disturb rather than help or comfort we are aware that they are too coarse to convey the finest sentiments that they are too bungling too awkward to carry the expressions of sympathy of love back and forth from soul to soul that are in tune with each other the message of love teaches that the love of life is a single heart beating through god and you and me one life runs through all creation's veins the mind sees beauties which the physical eye never beholds the mental ear hears harmonies melodies which the auditory nerve is too gross to perceive the soul through its closer union with god receives perceptions which even the mind cannot comprehend by means of this divine connection through the great within of ourselves we can accumulate power that will revolutionize our lives right here in our own being we can loose streams of energy infinitely more potent than any physical power we know that the great cosmic ether everywhere about us is filled with divine vibrations charged with spiritual force and omniscient intelligence which are always awaiting to flood our minds when we make the right connections and are ready to receive them this cosmic ether or universal substance is the source of all supply as well as that of that divine power which most people shut out of their lives because they do not know how to unite themselves with it they resolutely shut their minds to the divine inflow by refusing to believe in anything that is not demonstrable through the senses most of us are very skeptical of the reality of the unseen we are doubting thomases who can be convinced only by the material by that which we can see or feel if children could only be trained in a different atmosphere if they could be made at the start to reach out mentally into the unseen realities and utilize them for their own purposes just as we mold and fashion material things there would be comparatively few failures in life it was intended that man should live in perpetual contact with the power that created him that would keep him in tune with all that is healthful and good and pure and true but unfortunately we are constantly losing our connection and thus making ourselves impotent weak when we could be potent strong creative to live in wireless communication with the divine current that runs through all creation is to be in touch with divinity indeed is to be divinely successful no power outside of ourselves can cut us off from communication with this current even the worst criminals those who have been cut off from human society may still be one with their source if they choose the creator has not cut them off has not discarded them they have broken the connection themselves the creator would not blast with a thunderbolt would not crush with his wrath the most profane wretch that ever lived even though he should curse him for creating him the great love of the father would still sustain him keep him alive feed him permit the same beautiful sun to shine upon him as upon the greatest saint all the blessings of nature would still be there for his enjoyment would be given as freely to him as to the most devoted worshipper if we could only grasp this superb truth our oneness with the great creative principle of the universe it would transform the race it would banish fear it would bring peace and harmony into our lives it would give us a sense of security and satisfaction and happiness such as we never knew before until we realize our unity with god and one another we can never grow to our full stature we can never utilize the manifold powers at our command nor shall we ever reach that glorified manhood which matches the creator's pattern of the possible man until it is ingrained into every child's nature that he was not only created by his father mother god but that he is for ever after vitally connected with him that he is nearer to him than his own hands and feet 
closer than his own heartbeat this oneness of the child with his maker is the principle which must ultimately mould the race into perfect beings 